Welcome to the third block where we will look at the question, what is the science behind this innovative treatment we have seen before and how does the clinical outcome look like? Therefore, I've chosen one study uh, per indication. If you want to deep dive into the literature, please look at the homepage of um, credentis.com or if you have any comments or remarks regarding the clinical studies we will uh, look at, please send an email to myself. So let's start with an overview. What is the clinical evidence? For that product, we have two uncontrolled trials. We have five randomized controlled trials where the remineralization with codon repair was compared to fluoride varnish and or to placebo. And then we also have one big case series. So what has been measured? The clinically relevant parameter is the progression to cavity. Has the initial carious lesion progressed into a cavitated lesion? That's the question each study is investigating. And that can be measured visually, radiographically, or with a carious detective device. Maybe some of the devices mentioned here you might have in your clinic as well. Let's start with the first uncontrolled trial. Here, a change, excuse me, a change in size of white spot lesion has been measured morphometrically and with the visual analog scale. We see that in 93% of all cases, the white spot lesion became smaller after six months or within the period of six months. In the second uncontrolled trial, also the change in white spot lesion has been measured, but this time radiographically uh, with a subtraction method. And it was measured to be smaller in 86% of all lesions treated after 12 months. So the measurement was after 12 months. Let's have a look at the randomized control trials. The first one uses diagnodent to measure the density changes with a diode laser, and it gives a comparable value. In 93% of all cases, this value decreased significantly within six months. The second and the third randomized control trial evaluates and compares the size of the lesion over time by using the visual analog scale, the NUVAT scale, or other visual measurements. Here we can see that in 93% of the cases, or even 100% of the cases, a reduction in the size of the white spot lesion was measured after 12 or three months. The fourth randomized control trial used carry scan. That's an impedance spectroscopy where the um, uh, carry scan gives a value for carriers. Additionally, the size of the white spot lesion was measured with pilot shade. And here we saw a reduction in value over six months. The fifth randomized controlled trial also used diagnodent, and we saw a decrease in the diagnodent value after 12 months. The biggest number of patients was evaluated in the clinical case series. Here, the X-ray was used to visualize the remineralization and at the beginning of the treatment, visualize the defect, the initial carious lesion. And additionally, the diagnogram value was used to monitor the change. So let's have a look now at the success rates for each study. Clinically relevant parameter is to measure if the initial lesion has progressed into cavity or if a significant dentine involvement interproximally can be seen. The success rate lies, lies between 86 and 100% with codon repair to 35% compared with fluoride varnish. Uh, the 35% for fluoride varnish is um, carries inactivation. So in 35% of all cases, we can see an um, inactivation by using the fluoride varnish. So the success rate with codon repair is much higher. It can also translate it into um, another statistic um, which summarizes the literature and it gives an annual carries progression rate of 14% with fluoride varnish and 5% with codon repair. So we see that the carious progression is three times higher if we use only fluoride varnish, or if we say the way around, it's three times lower if we use cordon repair. This is a nice citation from the uncontrolled trial. The result suggests that the treatment of early carious lesion with the cordon repair is safe, 
and that a single application is associated with a significant enamel regeneration. If you want to see a list, um, oh, I apologize, it's in German, but if you want to see a list of all literature, you can visit the homepage. So now let's start and have a more detailed look or a closer look in one of the studies. Uh, we start with the case series, which investigated the interproximal lesions. In my clinic, roughly 90 to 95% of initial caries lesions are located interproximal. And five may be occlusal and a very small number um, are buccal caries, initial caries lesions. Here, the place where this case series um, has, has been done is a particular dental clinic for children. And we have used the cordon repair since 2013, 2014. And they have treated already more than 400 cases with the cordon repair. So I would like to thank the Schutzan Clinic for providing us with their data. Let's have a look at their cases. And we start with case number one. We see here the upper left molar or tooth number 26 which presents a D2 lesion on the mesial surface. So the carriers has surpassed already half the size of the enamel. And this first picture was taken at, or the first x-ray was taken at day of treatment. Then a second x-ray was taken 1.5 years later. And we see that the surface, the enamel has been fully remineralized. Additional to the x-ray, the carry scan was used to measure the remineralization and uh, the, or let's say the caries progression was measured or the caries regression also with the diagnocam. The diagnocam uses light transillumination and the tooth works like a light conductor. Caries and cracks would block light transmission and appear black. So if you don't see any dark spots, it means there is no caries and the tooth has been fully remineralized. The second case, also on the first molar, this time on the upper right, where we have a D2 lesion at day of treatment. And then 10 months later, we have a remineralization in that area. Again, the diagnocam was used to monitor caries progression, in that case, caries regression, and we see no dark spots interproximally between the premolar and molar. The last case I would like to look at in that case series shows D3 lesion on the lower left first molar at day of treatment and on the right picture, not even a year later, 10 months later. And also here we see a fully remineralized area on the mesial part and no dentin involvement anymore. To summarize those results, we can look at a table well, we should not forget that a uh, still very important component for success, especially with teenagers, is an improved oral hygiene and also a very tight recall interval. And then we can see in the table that we got some much, much better results in the year 2017, which reflects a learning with case selection. Whereas in the years before, 2015 and 2016, all D3 lesions have been treated. And in 2017, only D3 lesions, where the patient presented a good oral hygiene and was cooperative, has been treated non-invasive. So several new caries lesions, respectively a high caries activity, as you know, point towards a bad oral hygiene. And here we would have a less good success rate, a lower success rate for D3 lesions with bad oral hygiene. Good. So another study from um, Stollerieu, if I pronounce that correctly, was published, uh, recently published, 2019, and um, that measured as this one what we see here, which is done uh, in vitro. It measures the remineralization depth. If the tooth is treated with corridor repair, we can see that the micro hardness, which gives us a value for remineralization, is much harder in, in deeper layers of the enamel if we use cordon repair, which is named here P11-4. That's the 
technical term, we see that we can get a remineralization up to a depth of 200 micrometer. Whereas if we look at a control group where fluoride varnish was used, we have a maximum mineralization depth of 25 micrometer. So that's a big difference. And we have seen that difference quite nicely in the X-ray pictures we looked at before, where we also saw that a D3 lesion where the dentin is already involved was nicely remineralized after a certain period of time. Okay, occlusal um, treatment with the codon repair. Here I will refer to a study which was done at the University of Greifswald in Germany. And as you see on the headline, there were 70 teeth treated with codon repair, 35 with codon repair and 35 with fluoride varnish, so 70 in total. These were all molars, freshly erupted molars, where initial caries lesion was visible in the fissure line. And uh, because occlusally it's nicely visible, so the ICDAS-2 classification was used, that's the International Caries Detection and Assessment System, to visually measure the size of carriers. And that gives then a distinct change of visual or visual image. And additionally, the diagnodent was used to show the relative caries activity by using this laser fluorescence. So the diagnodent measures the integrity of the enamel and the ICDAS-2 classification is a visual inspection. The clinician does with his eyes, so to say. Here we have the values. On the left-hand side, the NUVAT scale was used, as I said before, to um, uh, inspect the tooth and measure the caries activity rate. And that was measured at day of treatment. So after zero months, then after three months and after six months. And we see the green columns. Um, those are the teeth treated with codon repair. And here we can see that a significant caries inactivation has happened over the course of six months. So the dark green bar became lower and lower and is below 20% after six months. On the right hand side, we see the values which were generated by using the diagnodent. And at day of treatment, we had a diagnodent value of roughly 40. And this value decreased over the course of the treatment. So it was one treatment, but over the time period of three and then to six months, this value decreased significantly. So we can conclude that the group treated with the Dorafat fluoride varnish has no significant reduction in carious activity, whereas the test group treated with codon repair shows significant decreases in carious activity by using the NUVAT scale and also by using the diagnodent. So we have covered interproximal and occlusal carries. Now we have a look at the buccal carries. This study was done in a private practice where the patients have been recruited who had at least one buccal initial carries lesion on each side. So in one patient, one side was treated with codon repair, and in the same patient, the other side was treated with the duoflat fluoride varnish. Here we have an example of one of those patients, uh, where we see in the upper row, the premolar was treated with the codon repair, and in the lower row, a premolar on the other side, but in the same patient, which was treated with duoflat fluoride varnish. And we can see very nicely after 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, and one full year, that regeneration with codon repair leads to a reduction in lesion size, whereas the treatment with fluoride varnish does not work in those cases. And we can nicely see that on the pictures, even on the small arrow, which presents an increase of a defect size with the fluoride varnish. Yeah, I would also make a small announcement that we should consider aesthetic cases. So if we have a white spot in an um, aesthetically demanding patient or in a very visible area, uh, we should think about the remineralization, which is happening, yes, but we will still see some white spots. Uh, so the white spot, on, if we look at the cases treated with the codon repair, is less visible, but it's still visible. And the reason is that the remineralization, so the 
de novo built hydroxy apatite crystals have a different orientation as the originally organically built hydroxy apatite. And therefore the light reflection is a bit different and it appears whiter than the natural enamel. So that's something to consider. For example, after debonding of brackets, when you have a white spot lesion around those bonding areas. If we summarize now all those cases from the study with the buckle initial lesion, uh, we had those photographs you have seen before were um, assessed by blended randomized photographs. And um, the decrease in defect size from day zero to day 180 after the treatment with codon repair shows no reduction of defect size with the fluoride varnish treatment and a significant reduction, those are the green bars with the codon repair. In the test group on the upper right, we see one outlier with a huge increase in carious activity. So one patient which had, oh, despite the fact of the treatment, a very huge increase in carious activity. That's one. And in a control group, we see that we have a few of those outliers, so a few patients, not only one, had a significant increase in carious activity when treated with the fluoride varnish. So for further literature, I announced it already earlier, you can click on that link or have a look at the first slide I have shown in that blog where you see the homepage of www.credentis.com. And then under the download section, you find all the literature which is publicly available. Thank you very much for your information. If you have any comments or remarks, you can send me an email to my email address you can see on the first slide.